Well, thank you all for coming today. We had a great keynote earlier in the week, and we're going to have an equally as good capstone presentation today. And for those of you who were able to attend the tour last night and see some of the collection of the history of science, I've heard nothing but people were as amazed as I was when Kerry, um, two years ago, gave me a tour through the collection. And so it's a great privilege for me to be able to introduce Kerry and have him here speaking today. Kerry is the curator of the History of Science Collections of the University of Oklahoma Libraries and the John and Drusa Cable Chair of the History of Science. His research is on the history of geology, astronomy, and cosmology, and science and religion. And with that, I'll turn it over to Kerry. Thank you so much, David, for that uh, introduction, and to David, Hendrick, and Danielle for inviting me to come. It is a joy and a privilege to be able to share with you this morning uh, the story of Galileo's telescopic discoveries as an example of thinking visually in the history of science. So thanks very much to each of you for coming to hear a talk by a historian of science. Uh, I have chosen to focus on just one case study in order to go into greater depth rather than to, uh, greater depth than would be possible with a, a, a overall survey. So settle back, it's the end of the week, engage your imagination in a different mode as you listen to this story and perhaps you will come up with some meta reflections connecting Galileo's world to your own world in the world of your research and of your experience this week. To begin, I'll say a brief word about the history of science collections at OU and define uh, three analytical terms. You've been in Oklahoma a week, so you may have realized that American football is a thing here. Uh, among historians of science, uh, the University of Oklahoma is actually better known for the history of science collections. The collections began in the 1950s with a gift of 6,000 rare books by Everett Lee DeGallier, an alumnus of the OU Geology School. Duane Roller, the son of a physicist, became the first curator and professor of the history of science. When he retired in 1990, a separate department for the history of science had already been created. There are now 11 faculty in the history of science program and we offer graduate and undergraduate degrees in the history of science. Marilyn Ogilvie, a specialist on women in science, became curator in 1991. Under her direction, the collections grew to 94,000 volumes before her retirement in 2008. I became curator in 2009, and we are now at 100,000 volumes. After we collect the books from donors or other sources, we preserve them in two climate-controlled vaults, and then we make them available to students and scholars for teaching and research. So imagine now that we're together in our most secure vault and the aroma of old books surrounds you. We shall browse the shelves together and select some of the treasures to explore around the theme of visual thinking. Let's take a moment to analyze what we're looking for. First, what I do not mean by thinking visually is the use of visual aids that supplement a text, as in this detail from the frontispiece of Vesalius's anatomical treatise on the fabric of the human body. The test for a visual aid in this sense is this. Can one fully understand the text by reading it without any reference to images? If so, then the images are supplemental in some way, visual aids which ornament the text, explain the text. Ornamental images like this are certainly fascinating and worthy of study for their, in their own right, but we will set them aside for our purposes this morning in order to focus instead only upon using images to think visually. In other words, I wanna focus on examples when both the text and the visual representations are necessary, when neither stands alone, when neither is sufficient or complete in itself, but when text and image must be read together in combination. And a shout out to Chase Stokes and the interesting research that he's, he, he presented this morning. 
If we think about the functions of visual representations, let visual aids be one vertex of a tetrahedron. And by the way, this is Leonardo's drawing of a tetrahedron. Setting that function aside, let's take this triangle as the base of the tetrahedron and see if we might plot three different ways of thinking visually on a continuum between the three corners. First, in this image, also from Vesalius, the illustration contains letters to designate different parts of the body. These letters in the illustration are keyed to corresponding letters in the text, where each structure is described and explained. Therefore, the text and the visual representation are interlaced and are read together in a coordinated manner. In this case, the image is not simply ornamental. It is not a mere visual aid. Yet there's more going on here. Notice that the muscles are contracted in an aesthetically pleasing manner a stunning way that gives us an impression of naturalism. A naturalistic representation aims to provide an illustration that evokes the appearance of the original. Muscles do not appear like this on the dissecting table. When the anatomist examines muscles, they are lifeless. These muscles are shown contracting as if in, in life. So this illustration goes well beyond the need for accuracy for the purposes of dissection. This is a naturalistic form of visual representation. Second, an anatomy work published at about the same time as Vesalius, but without the same artistic proficiency with Charles Etienne on the dissection of the parts of the, the human body. It turns out that Etienne's anatomy was just as accurate as Vesalius, but the illustrations do not have the same degree of naturalism. There is even a cutout in the woodblock to illustrate the portion of the body under dissection. So the Etienne illustrations move closer to the evidential corner compared with Vesalius. An evidential presentation aims to draw attention to particular aspects of the object, highlighting or explaining evidence in a visual manner regardless of the degree of naturalism. Third, some illustrations are didactic in nature. Steno was a renowned anatomist who performed an anatomy of the earth in the hills around Tuscany. He created this diagram to help readers think through how to dissect the rock formations they might find around them. Steno's schematic diagram explains the origin of rock formations in Tuscany in two cycles of three steps each. First, deposition of strata in originally horizontal layers then subterranean excavation, the formation of caverns, and then crustal collapse. Then repeat the same three-step cycle on a smaller scale. The question Steno posed is whether the geohistory of other regions of the world might be reconstructed using a similar visual logic. Now, this diagram is not at all naturalistic. It is abstract, even geometrical. It is based on evidence but its aim is much more than to present evidence. So it's didactic, a tool for thinking through the origin of rocks, for thinking through how one might reconstruct a history of the earth. So didactic images are visual tools for thinking. More than a visual aid that summarizes an independent verbal argument, didactic images are heuristic, leading us to discovery before the conclusion can be articulated verbally leading us cognitively but non-verbally to new understanding. They are thinking aids, not visual aids. So naturalistic, evidential, and didactic endeavors involve three dimensions of thinking visually. And in my work as a historian of science, I've found that making these distinctions helps me to better understand what is going on with visual representations in historical texts. Many images, of course, are a mix of these, or rather a mix of all four, so we might plot them relative to other images at any point within the tetrahedron. Let's test the thinking visually terms with an example from Galileo. With his telescope, Galileo discovered four satellites revolving around Jupiter. He printed more than 60 observations of their changing positions from night to night. The first point is that the observations are presented as a combination of text and illustrations intended to be read in combination. Second, these diagrams are definitely not naturalistic. We can cross that out. They were printed using an uppercase O turned sideways for Jupiter 
and asterisks for the satellites themselves. To some degree, they might be considered didactic because the sequence does provide a helpful way to think through how satellites might shift their positions over time, but the rep representations are primarily evidential because this is exactly how the satellites did in fact appear over a period of months on specific dates and times. Make sense? So that's the introduction, and now let's get started with the main story that we want to focus on, Galileo's telescopic discoveries. Let's go back more than 400 years to a world long before your own work could even be imagined. Yet perhaps upon meta-reflection, meta you may find some connections with your own scientific culture. At this time, Firenze or Florence is the capital of Tuscany. To the west on the delta of the Arno River is Pisa. This was a special place in time where science was affected by the surrounding culture in a way that sparked creativity. That special spark arose from deep and natural interdisciplinary connections, which are evident in Galileo's science. What made these difficult interdisciplinary connections creative and effective in Galileo's Tuscany? Well, one key aspect is related to the developed capacities to think visually. This is Galileo's Sidereus Nuncius, or Starry Messenger. It's the first publication reporting observations made with a telescope. So its publication in 1610 caused a sensation. It catapulted Galileo almost overnight from being an obscure mathematician and engineer in the Republic of Venice to now he was an international celebrity. Galileo discovered mountains on the moon in addition to the four satellites of Jupiter. In 2015, we put on a Galileo's World exhibit in which one gallery was devoted to Galileo and perspective drawing. This gallery explored the question, what was it like to be an astronomer in an era when art and mathematics were intertwined? And for the introduction to this gallery, I presented some summary theses, quote, in the Starry Messenger, Galileo reported his discovery of four satellites of Jupiter and mountains on the moon. These sensational telescopic discoveries were made possible by Galileo's training and experience in Renaissance art. Galileo's scientific discoveries occurred in the context of a specific artistic culture which possessed sophisticated mathematical techniques for drawing with linear perspective and handling light and shadow. When Galileo peered through his telescope and discovered mountains on the moon, he did so because he was seeing with the eyes of an artist. Contemporaries without artistic training were not able to see what Galileo saw. They were able to look through his telescope, but not to see, end quote. Because lenses at that time were of such poor quality, Galileo's discoveries were made not by optics, but by the artistic training of his eyes. Let's explore why this was so. First, were Galileo's engravings of the moon attempts to provide a naturalistic representation of the moon? Quite simply, no. Galileo was capable of drawing a naturalistic portrait of the moon when he wanted to, as in a manuscript known as the Florence Sheet now held in the National Library in Florence. This was drawn at the telescope. Contrast the first printed edition of the Sidereus Nuncius. We might ask, are the engravings in the Sidereus Nuncius copied directly from the manuscript drawings? The answer is clearly no. In particular, notice the crater in the bottom center of the engraving. There is no counterpart to this crater in any of the moons drawn on the Florence sheet. Why might this be so? Think for a moment about a field guide. Field marks have a didactic purpose. Field marks simplify some features and exaggerate others compared to a photograph or an artistic uh, depiction of the same bird. In the same way, Galileo's printed etchings of the moon are like, like the one on the left are like diagrams or didactic field marks. They serve a different purpose from the naturalistic sketches of the Florence sheet. In contrast to the naturalistic drawings, Galileo's printed etchings call attention to certain features and they teach us how to interpret what we are seeing. The printed etching on the left is didactic rather than naturalistic. 
Well then, were Galileo's engravings on the moon attempts to map the surface of the moon? Again, the answer is clearly no. The size of the crater at the bottom center is accurately depicted here in the Atlas of Hevelius. It is quite small. One misinterprets Galileo to accuse him of exaggerating its size. Galileo's book set off the 17th century race to map the moon. Not a race to go there, of course, but a race to map it. It's astonishing that this task was accomplished by mid-century in this comprehensive lunar atlas of Johann Hevelius, less than 40 years after Galileo's initial telescopic discoveries. And incidentally, for those who might hastily assume that Galileo marks a unique starting point for modern science, as something altogether new, the title page of this volume depicts Galileo in Middle Eastern dress as a tribute to the Islamicate optical tradition. But that's another talk. So Galileo was not exaggerating the size of the crater located here because he was not trying to map the moon. He was trying to help us think more clearly about the lunar surface generally. In contrast to Hevelius, Galileo's drawings are not evidential, but didactic. Before the moon could be mapped, first someone had to demonstrate there was something there, real surface topography that could be mapped. The assumption at the time of Galileo was that the shading of the moon was internal. Its outer surface is smooth as a marble. So Galileo showed us that is not so. He countered arguments that the moon's surface was smooth by teaching us how to see, how to observe the changing play of light and shadow. The white dots to the left of the shadow line are mountain peaks standing above the plains that are still in morning darkness. So this lunar de depiction leads us through a process of making three different observations over time. First, the small circle of light represents an isolated peak visible on a particular night shining above the darkness of the surrounding plain. The light triangular region immediately to its right designates a foothill. On a subsequent night, that very peak will appear farther from the shadow line, and the foothill to its right has become elongated, now appearing like a mountain ridge, with another ridge appearing immediately below it. And on some night after that, the the ridges have converged and the whole area takes on a circular appearance. Galileo was not mapping the moon, nor implying that a crater of that size is present in that location, but instead teaching us to observe the changing appearances of a single location on the moon over three successive nights. This diagram teaches us to interpret the changes of light and shadow on the surface of the moon. Galileo was showing us how to detect real lunar topography contrary to the Aristotelian physicists. So this is a didactic image leading us in a process of visual thinking. As a result, we now understand that a map of the moon will eventually emerge as a composite inference from the evidence of many nights observations. And that's what Hevelius did. Today, amateur astronomers who love the moon know that to stare directly at the illuminated side of the moon is blinding at night. Surface detail is entirely washed out. To map the moon, one must examine the shadow line, night after night, as it passes across the face of the moon. At the shadow line, and only at the shadow line, light moves back and forth, first one way and then the other, over the month-long lunar cycle, casting shadows in both directions at opposite phases. Some lunar features are visible on only one or two nights during the entire lunar cycle. That's the magic enchantment of the moon. From these studies, Hevelius assembled a definitive map of the lunar atlas. You can plot the Apollo landing sites with ease. To recap, Galileo sketched on the Florence sheet in a naturalistic manner what he saw through the telescope. In the starry messenger, he used didactic images to teach us to think visually about how lunar topography would appear in multiple observations taken over time, and less than four decades later, Hevelius produced an accurate map of the moon created as a composite of 40 individual portraits over a five-year span. Hevelius's composite map is a visual construction. The moon does not actually appear like the map 
on any single night of its cycle. So how did Galileo learn to see the lunar surface artistically before anyone else? How did he gain experience in the study of light and shadow? At that time in Tuscany, many young men enrolled in artisan workshops such as the Accademia del Disegno, or Academy of Drawing. In these artisan workshops, they would study Euclidean geometry in a hands-on way by learning the techniques of perspective drawing. Later in life, Galileo was elected an honorary member of the Accademia del Disegno. For their capstone project, students in these artisanal workshops would apply their geometrical drawing skills to a project in art, such as a painting or drawing, and go on to become artists. Or they might create a sculpture, or make a blueprint and go on to be sculptors or architects. Or they might create a design for a complex machine and go into engineering, as did Galileo. In artisan workshops, future artists and engineers studied side by side. This was interdisciplinary education in action, manifesting natural and organic connections between subject areas. It is worth pondering, compared to the role of perspective drawing in the artisan workshops, are your visualization principles and techniques of similar cross-disciplinary applicability? I think they likely are. Pedagogically, what is your equivalent today of the artisan workshops of Tuscany? Is this conference something similar? As a young man, Galileo studied in the artisan workshop of Juan Talenti, where lessons in geometry were given by Ostilio Ricci. Ricci's lectures there were also attended by Galileo's friend, the painter Chigoli. This is a painting by Chigoli in Rome of the Virgin Mary standing on the moon, but the moon shows craters as it appeared through Galileo's telescope. Galileo's later secretary, Viviani, recount, recorded that Chigoli stated that Galileo had been his teacher in the art of perspective drawing, writing, quote, in perspective, Galileo alone had been his master. This is the first English translation of Euclid's Elements of Geometry printed in 1570. In the chapter on the geometrical solids, this copy retains the original pop-ups, which helped beginning students learn to think three-dimensionally. Euclid, as studied in the Florentine artisan workshops, was the starting point for perspective. Euclid worked out the principles of the camera obscura. Camera obscura literally means a dark room. It consists of a box or container in which light enters via a small hole and projects an image on an opposite wall. The image will be reversed and upside down, but its proportions will be preserved and it can be traced to produce a realistic landscape. Renaissance artists had been familiar with the camera obscura for several hundred years, and it was well known to astronomers like Kepler and Galileo. The linear propagation of light in the camera obscura made it possible to draw with true perspective. To aid in perspective drawing, many additional instruments, tools, and techniques were developed. This geometrical drawing, for example, demonstrates true perspective. You don't get this effect by accident. This and other similar diagrams were drawn by Leonardo da Vinci. They were the only materials ever put into print by Leonardo during his lifetime, appearing in a work on drawing by Leonardo's friend, Luca Pacioli. Artists over the following century would practice the techniques and tools of perspective drawing by recreating geometrical figures like Leonardo's. They were thinking visually, learning to think visually. The, this explanation of perspective drawing comes from a work by Albert Durer, did you know he wrote a book called The Institutes of Geometry? Uh, it was similar in scope to the Pacioli, yet published a generation later. Durer here shows a variation on the per perspective drawing technique known as Alberti's window. The artist is creating a drawing of a lute with true perspective by means of a string running from the object through the canvas window to the vanishing point on the wall. This beautiful work by Sira Gatti 
was published when Galileo was a young man, and it, bridge, it brings the tradition of perspective drawing up to Galileo's time. Sierra Gatti was a member of the Accademia del Disegno, mentioned earlier. The work contains 64 full-page copper plate engravings, each with an accompanying page of text to train artists and engineers as they would start off easy and work through to more difficult exercises toward the end. Here is the obligatory exercise for the lute. Here are some exercises similar to the Leonardo drawings. Galileo worked his way through the Sirigati, practicing the techniques of linear perspective. He reproduced these and other drawings. Any young artist or mathematician working his way through Sirigati, like previous generations working through the exercises of Leonardo or Durer, would master perspective and the handling of light and shadow. I think the final exam for Sirigati is right here. Careful study of spikes on this ring and the shadows they cast prepared Galileo's eyes to interpret the shadows cast on the moon by mountains and other topographical features. Imagine that each spike is the same lunar mountain observed at different times under light from different angles, a different distance from the shadow line. Remember that Galileo reproduced this drawing before he ever encountered the telescope. Thomas Harriot, one of the leading astronomers in England, was observing the moon at the same time as Galileo with a telescope about as good and conversing with his friends about what they called the strange spottedness of the moon. Harriet and a friend concluded that the moon looks like an apple pie. Why did Harriet not discover the lunar mountains before Galileo? Harriet did not have the benefit of this tradition of artistic training and perspective drawing like Galileo. There was as yet no equivalent of Sirigati in England to help him interpret the strange spottedness in the changing shadows from night to night. Once Galileo published The Starry Messenger, Harriet quickly agreed because Galileo's printed engravings taught him how to see. During a visit to Florence, the French mathematician Jean-Francois Niceron met with Galileo's artist friend, Chigoli. Chigoli showed Niceron a perspective drawing tool Chigoli himself had invented, and Niceron published that technique in this book. In Florence, Niceron also viewed examples of anamorphic drawing techniques, such as Alberti perspective boxes. Make your own Alberti box by taping this image inside the long, long side of a shoe box. Then cut a siding hole at the small end of the box so that the narrow point P is positioned at the siding hole. Hold the box sideways up to your eye so that you can side along the diagram with your eye at point P. What picture do you see? Florentine artistic culture steeped in the techniques of visual thinking through perspective drawing was the midwife at the birth of Galileo's telescopic astronomy. Now this is the title page of the OU copy of the Sidereus Nuncius. Galileo's signature appears in the lower right corner. He inscribed this copy as a gift to Gabriel Cubera, a poet in the Medici court. Within the title itself, Galileo refers to the telescope as a perspicilli or perspective tube. Galileo regarded the telescope as one more tool for perspective drawing. Same principles apply. A generation after Galileo, Dorleon provided a comprehensive theoretical and practical discussion of perspective, vision, and optics. Dorleon adopted the lunar map of Hevelius, shown here, based on Hevelius's comprehensive telescopic observations, and the putty here are observing the moon with telescopes. But in another page in the same work, the putty are observing the moon not only with a telescope, but with the pantograph, a perspectival tool invented by Dorleon. The tradition of perspective that underlay Galileo's discoveries was not yet forgotten. Let's move forward to the late 19th century. Now this is not a photograph of the moon. No earthbound telescopes could then discern such detail. Naismith was a Scottish engineer best known for inventing the steam hammer 
He was an avid astronomer and an avid photographer as well. Carpenter was an astronomer at the Greenwich Observatory. Together, they constructed plaster models of the lunar surface. They photographed these plaster models using raking light or light from the side. With light rays coming from oblique angles, they were able to simulate shadow effects on the surface of the moon. The shadows Galileo observed on the moon revealed topographical relief. In the controlled conditions of their photographic laboratory, Naismith and Carpenter recreated the same effects in detail, which Galileo originally taught all of us to understand. The tradition of thinking visually continued. If Thomas Harriet, Naismith, or Carpenter were to join the faculty at your university or institution, do you think they would advise students from their personal experience of the necessity of developing modes of visual thinking? But you don't need Leonardo or Durer or Sirigatti or Galileo to tell you that your work in visualization science is critically important. But they do. So that's Galileo's telescopic discoveries. Let's briefly glance at a few other examples of thinking visually in the world of Galileo. Galileo published a description of sunspots in 1613 as they appeared through his telescope. Two years earlier, the Jesuit Christoph Scheiner argued that sunspots are little planets like Venus revolving around the sun some distance from the sun. Galileo rebutted Shiner with letters on sunspots. This book features a stunning sequence of full page copper plate engravings of the solar disk in exquisite detail. By tracking the motion of sunspots across the face of the sun, Galileo proved that they were on the sun's surface not little planets circling around in orbits above. Let's browse his observations for 28 days, and as we do, note how the spots move together across the sun. By moving together and moving slowly, they take about a month to go all the way around. That's not like planets. Note how irregular they are in shape and how they form and disappear with irregular timing. That's not like planets either. Especially notice the foreshortening of the spots as they approach the edge of the solar disk in the lower right. That foreshortening proves they're on the surface. Galileo's visual evidence was demonstrative and persuasive. Shiner eventually published the definitive work of the 17th century on sunspots, and in that work he accepted Galileo's argument that sunspots move like ships on the surface of the sun. Shiner also recognized that this conclusion suggested that the sun and the heavens are corruptible, that is that they change, a tenet contrary to Aristotle, but already accepted by many theologians, including Cardinal Bellarmine an eminent Jesuit whom Shiner admired and with whom Galileo had a notable conversation. Another example of Galileo's expansion of our visual world is the microscope. A generation before the well-known microscopic public publications of Robert Hooke and Jan van Leeuwenhoek, Galileo adapted the telescope into a new instrument which a friend of his in the Academy of the Lynx named a microscope. This poster-sized work is the first publication of observations made with a microscope. Two other Lynx members, Federico Chesi and Francesco Stelluti, studied the anatomy of the bee as it appeared under the lenses of Galileo's microscope. Because only a handful were printed, the type has bitten deeply into the paper. Only four intact printed copies survive. Along the top are representatives of representations of four ancient coins depicting bees. The work celebrated the accession to the papacy of Galileo's friend, Maffeo Barberini, 
Not coincidentally, the Barberini family crest displays three bees. And in a work of the same time, Stelluti published drawings of the bee as seen under Galileo's microscope. And if anyone wonders why three microscopic bees happen to appear in the same arrangement as on the Barberini crest, well, that's kind of a grant proposal, 17th century style. Yet, just as Galileo's telescope brought near the distant moon and stars, so through Galileo's microscope, the eyes of the lynx could fathom the secrets of the small, portraying structures of the bee never seen before, which are described in the text of the Apiarium. The text of the Apiarium includes classical knowledge about bees as well as the new discoveries integrated in a tabular outline. So the chunks of text have themselves become the visual elements in the Apiarium. Rather than composing a discursive treatise with a linear argument in a logical progression, the paragraphs are broken up into separate blocks. The layout encourages multiple pathways through the document. The flow of reading is undetermined. One might read it piecemeal and digest it incompletely or incrementally over time. And perhaps the visual arrangement might suggest new permutations and combinations, new connections and relations between the various chunks of content in the overall uh, topics considered. Let's compare this really interesting feature of the Apiarium with another publication of the links. Francisco Hernandez compiled the most important early natural history of the Americas, shown here. After spending nearly a decade with the Aztecs in central Mexico in the 1580s, it was finally published in 1651 with clarifications and notes contributed by nearly all members of the Academy of the Links, including Galileo. The descriptions include Aztec names and medicinal uses for the Mexican plants. But I wanna draw attention to something often overlooked. The last 50 pages of the volume are a tabular layout created by Chasey. Chasey's tables sought to discern the natural order by means of schematic diagrams similar to the layout features we encountered with the Apiarium. This goes on for 50 pages. Here the tabular method is applied to the ordering of plants and animals long before the explosion of taxonomy in the classical works of Linnaeus and others in the 18th century. Did the tabular layout itself have a didactic effect on taxonomic method in this case? Uh, to date, there's not been enough scholarship um, uh, done to answer this question. So Galileo's letters on sunspots, the Apiarium, and the Hernandez tables are just a few additional examples of thinking visually in Galileo's world. And now to conclude. With the single exception of the Florence Sheet Manuscript, all rare book images are courtesy of the History of Science Collections at OU, and the books used in this talk were among those set out last night uh, for the open house. How many of you were, are there people here who were present last night? Thank you for coming to both, my goodness. Peruse these sources if you would like more along these lines. First, uh, Galileo's World Exhibition Catalog. Particularly, you can look at the gallery on perspective drawing in case you have a long flight home. Um, and I've also added two new episodes the, on the role of visual thinking in reconstructing the history of the earth and the significance of visual thinking in the work of Charles Darwin. Uh, just, just spectacular example in my opinion. I have two short published articles on the former and another exhibition catalog for Darwin and links to all of these are found on the Vimeo page where I've uploaded an advanced recording of this talk. Um, so the video link or QR code is the only one you need. And the video is on the open internet so please feel free to share it um, now and in the future. To think of visual thinking in terms of naturalistic, evidential, and didactic modes, 
makes sense of what I see in the case of Galileo and his world. These modes of visual thinking have proven helpful to me with regard to other episodes, uh, such as, as I've just mentioned, the history of the earth and Darwin's investigations into the nature of life. But more importantly for today, think about what you've seen and heard this week during the conference and consider your own work over the long term. Are case studies like this one from the history of science applicable in any way to your field? Are there any cultural connections or meta reflections that have occurred to you while listening to the story of Galileo's telescopic discoveries, which relate to your own work? I welcome hearing your thoughts along any of these lines. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Carrie. I think I want to start off by echoing Chris Johnson's words from Slido, which is, what a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Um, starting, our, our most upvoted question right now is from Mike Gleischer. The importance of being a master artist is so clear in Galileo and Hooke's Micrographia. What was the process of Galileo's printed work? Was he a master engraver in addition to a master painter and pencil drawer? What medium was he working in? And how did he adapt to the challenges of the print technologies? Oh, wow, what a superb question. Uh, let me refer uh, you, if you want to know more about this, uh, there's a three volume work called Galileo's O, and it goes into far more detail than I will hear. Let me just say that he was a master artist, um, and he, was proficient in, in the watercolor uh, uh, depictions of the moon of, on the Florence sheet. Also, he knew how to engrave copper plates and he did that. But for economic reasons and expediency, most often he hired someone else. Uh, those of you last night were able to see his first and rarest published work, The Compasso. It's a book on an ancestor to the slide rule. That book was actually produced in his own home. You could not buy that from a book bookseller, as was the instrument, which also involved engraving on it. Um, so eventually he hired an assistant who he and his family lived full time in his own home, and eventually he, he outsourced as well. Uh, for the Sidereus in particular, the copper plate engravings uh, for re in order to publish hastily were actually printed by a, a different printer than the printer who did the text. So the books were first printed with all the text, then sent to the other printer who received at the very last minute Galileo's plates and then printed them. And uh, this is just gives rise to all sorts of intricacies. I highly recommend watching a recent uh, episode, it aired during the pandemic, on a forgery of the Sidereus Nuncius that claimed to be Galileo's own copy that basically substituted where the engravings exist in our copy, in almost all copies, uh, it had uh, watercolor drawings with ancient ink that were halfway in between the Florence sheet and the, and the engravings. And so it was forged and passed off as Galileo's proof text. And it's now been completely debunked. And you can read about all the forensic tests and everything else, including the printing history, in those three volumes that I mentioned, Galileo Zo. And if you want my own account of that, I'd be happy to share another talk that I've given on that topic. Fantastic. So diving a little deeper into that and, and thinking about how we might bring some of these lessons into our own practices, Elsie uh, Lee Robbins is asking, how can we incorporate more artistic skills and practices into visualizations? Oh, I love that question. In 2015, when we did the Galileo's World exhibit, where we were able to tell this story to people locally at, at the University of Oklahoma, a professor of engineering uh, was able to gain funding from the president of the university for what we called a dream course. And she taught that course to beginning engineering students so they could learn the basic techniques of perspective drawing. And the funding for that course actually allowed her to bring in experts from, 
across the country and at least one international to give talks, special talks that were open to the public. But her conviction was that if students in engineering only learn how to draw CAD diagrams, they're not going, they're not actually thinking visually. They're hacking. They're, they're getting the result. Developing that cognitive capacity to think visually was something that she and the College of Engineering felt was worth the investment of this course. So that is basically my way of saying, when you know how to answer that question, would you please let me know? Because I think that's a, just a tremendous challenge that we face. Well, it's so interesting to hear because I feel like for those of us who teach, there's always this push to make sure we're teaching the state of the art. And yeah. sometimes we lose sight of a lot of these foundational skills. Thank so, you. I'm, yes. Uh, yeah, I'm curious, just like building on your work and the observations you've seen both with Galileo and with other studies that you've done. Um, you know, we're, I think, increasingly having a push to leverage automation, to leverage advances in machine learning, to kind of bootstrap a lot of what we're doing in the visualization community for, for very good reasons. But what are we losing by moving away from this more slow, handcrafted approach to visualization and increasingly integrating automation and other digital steps to accelerate the process of developing visualizations? I leave it to you to decide whether we are undermining the skills necessary for advanced visual thinking in your field. I'm a historian. I suspect that may be the case, but I'm not a, not, not a data scientist. But I will say this. I believe that every profession has as an integral part of its own character and identity a sense of its formative history. Without that sense of disciplinary identity, a profession will splinter and fragment and disappear and be co-opted. So when you are thinking about the nature of the profession today, reflect on the significance of the way you pass a sense of history onto newcomers in the profession. To me, that's a critical point often overlooked and that gets to the level of culture. I was really trying to argue that it was a cultural underpinning that made possible the widespread capacity for visual thinking in Galileo's Tuscany. And, and that, that to me is, um, if we don't recognize that kind, of, um, uh, that kind of cultural aspect, that, that, that forming a scientific field is a culture forming enterprise. It's not just about the information and techniques and history has to be part of that. So, hope it's that an, helps. Yeah, it's an incredibly profound point. And I think one that really resonates with a lot of the energies and efforts that are going on here. I think in particular, Melanie Torrey this morning was talking about how do we think about increasing the diversity of our community? And I know for many years we thought about what does it mean to, you know, in addition to preserving our own internal identity, open up the community to more diverse voices. So as a historian who's been able to kind of peek in and join us throughout the week, um, I'm really curious if you think that there are steps we can take to make the conference more welcoming to historians or to others who are adjacent to your intellectual community. Oh my goodness, I just loved every bit I was here. I wish I could have been here full time all, all the week. So let me say that, that the papers that I attended, I found to be really interesting. They were accessible as far as I could go, although very quickly with many of them I was over my head, but I could still see what the point was. So you're already doing an expert job communicating to others who don't share exactly the same problem set, but you're, you're, com you're communicating to fellow experts your own field very, very well. I thank you for making room for a historical presentation and for coming to it. That's a major step. How often do historians even get invited? So thank you. It, it truly is an honor uh, to be invited to speak to scientists. I, I appreciate that more than words can say. Well, it's an absolute honor having you here and giving us this perspective as well. You know, one of the things that I think often happens in our community is that sometimes we find ourselves accidentally reinventing the wheel or drawing on past questions and then, you know, I. I 
can certainly speak from my own experience then after the paper appears you're randomly browsing around you see somebody actually tried to do this in a similar way 30 years ago and just missed it in that lit review so i'm curious going back far more than 30 years what are some of the questions that you have seen people wrestling with in your work that you might have seen come up again throughout the week yeah that's a that's a tremendous question um there there's certainly um, times when, wh whenever one takes a long view of the history of science, and that can be relative, uh, the, 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 p the puzzle solving activity, as Kuhn talked about, no longer characterizes the scientific enterprise. Rather, with sufficient macro vision, the creativity of communities, not just individuals, but the resourcefulness and persistence and sheer creativity of people really comes to the fore. And that's the ingredient that isn't quite so obvious in the day-to-day -day grind. But that's what really, what, what all the day-to-day -day grind depends on is those, the, that human creativity that is, that is, that are comprised the, um, the new, new stages, new phases of a field. So I think it's, it's just essential to realize that um, uh, maybe, maybe another, I'm circling around the question, but another principle comes to mind and that's the Columbo effect. You've all seen maybe the, uh, the now long ago television series of mysteries by Lieutenant Columbo where there's a, he always solves a murder because there's one small anomaly that won't, won't fit. Uh, and he just, he just dogs on that. And uh, eventually he can recast the whole paradigm until that makes sense. And that always is happening, which means that there are, there are attentions. It, it can be worthwhile to go back to old problems and see if they can be recast in a new light that's actually going to, with Cur current advances and a burst of creativity might just reshape a field. So that is a pattern that happens over and over. Fantastic, thank you. And I wanna close with one last question here, which is thinking about how we can communicate further outside of our, our borders and outside of the work that we've been seeing here today. And that's thinking about what you've seen for the development of visual thinking. In particular, visual literacy, visualization literacy is a topic of discussion here. Um, what lessons might the development of visual thinking offer for new approaches to developing visual or more specifically visualization literacy? Gosh, a wonderful question. Uh, dear to my heart, because one of the ways that, that I feel rare books can speak to the public and awaken their interest in science and in the history of science is through these remarkable visual representations that invite questioning and exploration. But I, I think that's equally true about your own work. Uh, the presentations that I've been to have featured visualizations that are, are captivating uh, and I think do have the ability to draw in people who are experts in other fields as well as a general audience. So keep on doing what you're doing. I, I, I have, uh, I'm not qualified to give you any advice on that. Well, thank you so much for a fabulous talk. There's so many profound points to think about that I know at least they're gonna give me a lot of thinking to do on the flight home. So let's thank Carrie one last time. Thank you all so much. What amazing questions. And I'd like to invite David and Hendrick up and we're gonna to move to the closing session. Thank you very much, it was really cool.
Well, unfortunately, it seems that the week has gone by way too fast. Um, I hope you've had as good of a time as we've had here. And I just found the um, capstone so enthralling and a really good way to really think back and reflect on um, all the things that we do. So as we said our motto a year ago for our committee, since we we're coming back in person for the first time um, for a while, is it's all about the people you met, you meet, and we hope it was all about the people you met that you really got a chance of that community and that inspiration and creativity. And we assume there'll be lots of new innovation that comes out from being here this week. So we ended up with uh, 1,357 attendees in total. So we grew in size over the course of the week. So thank you to those of us who have joined us since, or those of you who have joined us since the opening. Um, about half the attendees were on site, 627. The other half were online or part of our diversity cohort, where we actually had 233 people join us as part of that cohort. I also would be remiss if I did not thank our supporters for making this week possible, especially our platinum supporters, Northern Data and Tableau. Uh, but thank you to all of the supporters for really making this event happen. Uh. Also, thank you very much for the tech and the web team for <laughs> not stressing out <laughs> at any point during the week. Um, I think that was a major contribution to the success of this conference. And we want to do a little exercise because we want to thank all of the volunteers and specifically the organization committee uh, here you see a lot of pictures of people who helped contributing to make this uh, conference a success. And if you're in the room, maybe quickly stand up so that you can receive your applause. And there's another group of people uh, whom you have seen along the week uh, behind the technology stack, uh, helping you getting to certain points, helping you to run the sessions at all. And this is the elite group of people, the student volunteers, please stand up. You can tell we've been practicing this closing all week. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, just as a, an aside, if you looked at the videos online and how to be a session chair or how to give a paper, look at the outtakes. Um, it was a lot of fun putting this on. So we really want your feedback, right? We're, we take all the feedback we've gotten during the week as things have come up, tried to adapt. I know the conference chairs next year in the VEC really appreciate the feedback and ways we can make this experience better. So please fill out the post-viz questionnaire. And looking back at the week, we started it off talking about the role of text and visualization. And today we got an interesting context in the history of science telling us about that. And it's been an incredible week. So. Still your part. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, but it is great when, when you look at, and it wasn't planned that way, although maybe, it, maybe Carrie, um, you know, the two of them coordinated behind her back, so we didn't know that, that Marty and Carrie did, to really talk about the interplay of those two things. But also, hopefully you got a chance to enjoy our banquet at the First Americans Museum. I thought it's a really unique venue here in Oklahoma and a chance to um, experience the history of Oklahoma. I thought the food was really good. I thought the venue was beautiful. And I wish I would have gone out more time to be in the purple light that I didn't realize was out there. Yes, uh, as we said before, uh, we, we met actually in various ways. 
So I'm not sure if you saw this on, on uh, one of the Discord channels. So there was a little bit of a metal banging thing going on. Here's just an impression of the tech stack. Yeah, so this is essentially when you entered the room to the left or to the right, this is what you saw. Uh, and this is the prototype setup that was copied into eight rooms and at maximum capacity. So it is it was really an undertaking and it wouldn't again, it wouldn't have been possible without the help of all the volunteers, but also with help of Prestec, our A B company. And also, uh, thank you to everyone who took the extra time to speak with and mentor our many, many new faces that came to visit here. And a, a special thank you to Alex Endert, Vidya Settler, and Petra Eisenberg for serving as our AMA participants, having these smaller intimate discussions with people who are just starting out in the field. Um, so it was a great, great way to range from our, our small group discussions to even our hybrid panels where we had a little Wizard of Oz dynamic going on here, um, but it was really an interesting experience getting to be so involved in this first hybrid viz. And you know, we hope you all had a wonderful time um, and we're looking forward to hearing your feedback about how we can make these processes better for you in the future. And you know, it is a lot of work putting this conference on, but we feel we've all been very fortunate to be working with a great group and being able to enjoy the experience as well. I told the organization committee to make sure you spend, find some time to organize during the week and find ways to de-stress. And you can see we tried to set a good example as conference chairs and can be very creative in finding supplies in a remote small town in Germany to have your gin and tonic to de-stress as all the, uh, all the things are going on. And we want to quickly highlight of some of these events that will come up soon. So the first of these is happening right around the end of March, a familiar time for many of us here. And that is the Visualizing Biological Data or VISB conference for 2023. So this will be happening in Heidelberg, Germany. Um, the keynote speakers are Arzu Chitotin, uh, Stefan Brackner, and Martin Dorn. Uh, in particular, there should be some absolutely fascinating, fabulous discussions at the intersection of visualization, data science, and biological data. So that should be a great event to be a part of. Oh. And Pacific Viz will take place in Seoul, South Korea, April 18th to the 23rd. And if you're thinking of submitting a paper, please <laughs> go online today and put an abstract in. It's a placeholder to submit your full paper, so your abstract doesn't need to be your final abstract. Just get your submissions in today. And um, the notes paper, you have a little while longer. Those will be um, due in December and posters in February. And there will be a workshop on visual data story. There will be a workshop on Viz Meets AI and a visual data storytelling contest. And here is the committee that's putting it together, and they need your help, so please submit, and we hope to see you in Seoul. I'm filling in for the um, Chair Yun Jang, who I believe is already on a plane. So um, it will be a great event. Okay, so we have a presentation for Eurovis. The only thing I want to mention, this Eurovis is close to my heart because it's also closest to my hometown that in this conference will ever get. So I'm looking forward. So hi, my name is Daniel Wiegreffe. I'm from Gerek Scheuermann's lab at Leipzig University. He had to catch his plane earlier today. So on his behalf, I would like to invite you to the next Eurovis in Leipzig. So where is it? It's in Leipzig, central eastern part of Germany. You can get there very easily by, by plane, Frankfurt, Munich, whatever. Also, but also very easily by a train, for instance, from Berlin, Frankfurt, or Munich. And if you want to enjoy the experience of the German Autobahn, we have several routes to reach <laughs> Leipzig. But you can also do science in Leipzig. The call for paper for full papers is already online. Deadline is December 2nd. Uh, the call for papers for stars is also already online. The deadline for the sketches is not today. It was slightly extended till Mondays, you still have the weekend. <laughs> Enjoy. So 
See you next year in Leipzig. Bye bye. Okay, we, we have already thanked a lot of people who contributed to this WIS conference and to make it a big success. In addition, we want to give two of the volunteers a special recognition and in fact a, a certificate of appreciation. And these are Alexander Bock and Joshua Levine. If you are here, please come to stage. Let me say a few words about the main drivers of the conference, our, our, our three general chairs. At a normal conference, general chairs are appointed three times, three years in advance. So they have time to shadow the other general chairs, to get used to it, to learn how it works, and then from a certain point to step in and drive the conference. This was in normal times. times. Nothing was really normal with this this conference because due to several reasons, mainly COVID, we, are, uh, uh, we, we, we appointed them at a very late time. So that means basically they had to go from zero to full speed almost immediately. Not only this, they also had to deal with all these problems of hybrid conference. It was completely unclear how it works. There was no role model left. How many people will show up? Will any people show up at all? Will people be online? That was completely clear, and they had to make a concept out of this. And they survived, they succeeded, and together with many, many volunteers that are still here in the room, they were able to provide a wonderful and incredible conference. And, and they can be, I think you can be really proud of what is here. Thanks a lot for all your work for this conference. They are relaxed now. Let, let's go for future years. Uh, next year, 23, we are in Melbourne. Tim, Sarah, and, and, and Michael are going to drive this, and we hear about this just in a second. 2024, Tampa Bay, Florida, Paul Rosen, Christy Potter, and Remco Chang are the general chairs. 2025 is almost set, but not completely. So we are not able to announce it here, but very soon we are in the process of finalizing it. 2026, the process of finding general chair and location starts in February. It's a two-step process. So if you're interested in doing this, please check our webpage where the algorithm is described and go for, and the reward is to be so relaxed than these guys after finishing this conference. <laughs> Finally, uh, I just have to mention it again and again. Our WIS conference is almost entirely driven by volunteers, and we can only succeed, su succeed in future if we have enough volunteers. So please, volunteers, and there are different ways to get involved. Some of them are just written here. You might uh, volunteer for the organizing committee, for the program committee. You might elect or get elected for the WEC or the steering committee, or you might even consider becoming a general chair for future WIS. Only if we volunteer and, and uh, work with this, we are, we are able to continue this conference. And with this, I'm done and I think we are ready now to go to Melbourne. Hi, I'm. 
hello. Actually, hold on a second. Is this one? Oh, there we go. Hi. Hold on a second. We're going to switch laptops if that's okay because we had some um, buffering issues. One last opportunity for technical difficulties. <laughs> Suspend. Suspend. <laughs> Ooh, okay. Woohoo. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Tim Dwyer. And I'm Michael Wybrow. And neither of us is our co chair, Sarah Goodwin, who sadly couldn't join us in person, but will join us in welcoming you to Melbourne in October 2023. Roll movie. So, Melbourne is a large, modern, and diverse city situated on the southeast of Australia on the banks of the Yarra River. The traditional owners of the land are the Kulin Nation, and their name for Melbourne is Nam. This is our conference venue, the Melbourne Convention and Exhibition Centre. It's right in the heart of the city, on the banks of the Yarra River, and is surrounded by many food, coffee, and hotel facilities. Now, a highlight of any discerning tourist trip to Melbourne should be a visit to our data visualisation and immersive analytics lab at Monash University. Uh, Tourism Victoria may need to update their website to reflect this, though. But if you stop by our lab, you can participate in exciting data understanding experiments and we'll reward you with a gift card and occasionally slight motion sickness. Melbourne is multicultural, with a fusion of European, Asian and many other influences with a rich culture and cuisine. It has great food, coffee, and bar culture, as well as live entertainment. You can safely explore the many laneway venues that were the birthplace of bands that are now household names, from ACDC to King Gizzard and the Lizard of Wizard. <laughs> the city of Melbourne is situated on Port Phillip Bay, which means opportunities for boating and enjoying beautiful sheltered beaches. Phillip Island and diverse national parks with unique flora and fauna. Melbourne's wildlife is unique, generally cuddly, and not at all deadly, despite what you may have been led to believe. We're living proof. We fully expect most conference attendees to survive and return home to tell their stories. There are opportunities for exploring the wilderness by hiking, biking, boating, golfing, ballooning, sailing, or just mingling with our improbable wildlife. So please get to work on your fantastic papers in time to submit them at the end of March 2023, or prepare your workshops, tutorials, panels, art, or posters. And we'll look forward to seeing you in Melbourne in our beautiful springtime. So as we end the last session today with a mix of exhaustion and excitement and the sun sets on this year's wonderful conference, start thinking about and planning your trip to Melbourne and Australia and make the most of IEEE Viz 2023 as it becomes a truly global conference in this, its first visit to the Asia Pacific region. Thank you. All right, and with that, I would like to again thank Hendrik and David and all of you for making this a fantastic experience. Uh, in the spirit of Oklahoma, happy trails, everyone. We hope you had a wonderful time at Viz, and we're looking forward to seeing you next year in Melbourne.